No, no, you can cook rice. All that I'm saying is, solar cooker is fanciful, so we do that. For example, the biomass is one half the cost of LPG, is more efficient. It's, in fact, people now who understand the economics of biomass are moving from LPG to biomass. In other words, will solar cooker work? Of course it may. Don't forget, BP has a solar business in this country. It's called BP Solar with Tata's joint venture. They make solar panels for the rest of the world. So we spent a lot of time asking whether that's the first thing to start, even though it's fashionable. We rejected it as the first thing to start. But the design is such, if you want to add a solar cooker, it's plug and play. You can plug a solar cooker to this. You can put an LPG to it. Actually, we are working on a lamp which will be charged. So you can use the lamp when you're in the going uh, out in the village in the night. So there are a lot of things you can do. But all that I would say is, let us not start with a solution. Let us start with a problem. Let's start with a consumer and work backwards. Rather than saying solar cooker is the fancy thing to do, so let's give them solar cooker. Uh, it may not work. Just remember, we had uh, Gobar gas plants, is it not? It was very popular at one time. Has anyone seen how to clean a Gobar gas plant? <laughs> what it takes to clean one of them? <laughs> and the funny thing in the village is, the fellows who can afford to have cow dung or buffalo dung are the rich ones. And they don't want to go cleaning Gobar gas plants. On the other hand, the people who get it, uh, they have to pay for it, they can as well go and collect wood. In other words, what I'm saying is, I remember Gobar gas plant was a very popular, it never took off. So we had to ask, what have we learned from our past? And why things don't work? And uh, how to make it work? So I'm not saying solar will not work. I say for cooking, to give a platform with enormous flexibility, solar may not be the first choice. That's all that I'm saying. It's a very nuanced, simple statement. Uh, solar may work. I know you had a question, sir. So my name is Surinder Singh. I want to really ask, what, up to what extent political will is handicapping entrepreneurial resources in the education sector? How fast? Have you have you studied this one? And the second I would break to if we put the central budget to say government budget on the education is more than ninety five thousand dollars. It's not a question of the quantum of resources. Basically that the resources are not being productively used in the public sector. How do we come in on the big part, political will part becoming a handicap in terms of responding the education? Yeah, I started by saying four assumptions for me. Antidote to poverty is wealth and wealth creation. Wealth creation requires entrepreneurship and innovation, but that requires good governance, and good governance requires political will. I would just leave you to decide whether have we have... Studied? No, no, no. I, see, I hardly come to Delhi. I go to the villages, and I think uh, that's where the fun is. So I, I do not know where, how much political will there is. So I, I've not studied it, therefore I dare not comment. Uh, but all of you know the answer to the question anyway. Uh, my name is Poyan Pandey and I represent Bennett Coleman Company. Uh, uh, thank you so very much indeed for making a brilliant presentation and I was attracted towards one of the points that you tried to display on this screen and that was that you have been trying to talk about uh, the NGO and uh, how do they really become self-sufficient and also do something which is tailor made to the local needs. On the other hand, you have also been trying to suggest to them and also to the private sector to come together and work for larger good, quote unquote. In India and elsewhere as well, as you know, both the sectors, private and the NGO sector, and the civil society, and the voluntary sector, they have their own virtues and they specialize in certain areas. Say, for instance, NGOs are good in convening capacities, private sector has a lot of funds and creativity and such. How do you really, because there are complexities when you talk about a fruitful partnership between NGOs and the private sector. 
how do you really reconcile, given the context in which they operate, how do you really reconcile the fact that they have a lot of difficulties and the relationship, more often than not, range from being benign to each other and they go on to being neglectful to each other. What is the kind of mantra or the advice that you would give to both the sectors in order for them to understand each other better and try to come to each other, understand each other better, and together they try to work for the larger good which is going to impact the people in the community. I think it's a fairly straightforward thing. I don't think that uh, these are irreconcilable uh, differences. Unfortunately, the poor have become a constituency rather than a problem to be solved. And we carry too much ideological baggage. Private sector cannot be trusted, civil society is difficult, uh, public sector does not believe in this, and if you have a uniform solution to everybody. I have no problem working with uh, civil society. First, you have to be transparent and honest. And now I'm not giving anything away. I wrote a paper called Co-Creating Businesses New Social Compact last year in the Harvard Business Review. And that won the best paper award. And the logic was very simple. If you want to work with civil society, you have to be transparent. In BP, we went and told them. This is where our costs are. We have to make money. Tell me how to do it. They were more capable of telling me good ideas on how to reduce costs because they always have worked with very little resources. So if you co-opt them, if you're willing to transparent, if you tell them this is the profit I want to make because I want to reinvest in the business, they're willing to work. On the other hand, if you hold each other hostage or if you start with an ideological bias, this thing will not go anywhere. So I say start with transparency, and if you are the company, take the first mile. You extend your hand first. Don't wait for them to do it. People will come. You have to. I don't know whether you noticed. Indian Institute of Science professor said something very interesting. I love to work with this company. We put an enormous time pressure on these people. It's amazing for me what they can create. Same thing with NGOs. They're our best friends. They're pushing us to do more. Uh, I don't know whether you saw, Prema Gopalan is an NGO. And she's a tough one, I can tell you. Very good, very honest, and a very tough negotiator. But if you're open, they're willing to support her. So we have to get high level of transparency. And once you're transparent, there's nothing to hide and say you want to work with me or not. Some people may still go and criticize you, that's okay. But some people will work with you. 